the theme of this year's cafes is connections. And I want to highlight a couple of things that have been going on with Archaeology Southwest. Uh, again, for those of you who don't know us, we're a private nonprofit. Go back to 1982 in terms of our founding. And we focus on preservation archaeology here in the U.S. Southwest and Mexican Northwest. And one of the projects that we've really invested a lot in lately is our Great Bend of the Gila uh, National Monument effort. And Aaron Wright and Marin Hopkins have been working with 11 uh, tribal uh, groups who have ties to the area from about Buckeye all the way down to about 40 miles west of Gila Bend on the Gila River. And so connection in terms of native groups who have ancestral ties to place and reconnecting uh, their interests to that place on the land. Ultimately, we hope there will be a, a national monument that comes out of that, that uh, process, probably going to be in the next administration. So uh, we're, we're in it for the, the long haul here. Switching gears to tonight's uh, talk and speaker, Michael Smith has come down from Phoenix. Uh, he's a professor in the School of Chess. School of Come on, come on, it's a test. Chess. <laughs> human social evolution? Close. School of Human Evolution. Human evolution and social, social change. change. All right. I don't understand it either, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't get that right. Um, his focus in terms of his research interests are uh, looking at Aztec uh, society down in, in central Mexico, uh, studying urbanism. And I think he's got a story to tell you about uh, how he got involved in our research process that looks at some of these processes and how they might relate past and present. So I will turn it over to Michael and thank you so much for coming down and joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Um, you know, normally you come to an archaeology cafe and you expect to hear about sites and artifacts and excavations and pottery and pit houses and that kind of thing. I'm not going to talk about any of that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about what happens to archaeological findings after we've done the, the analysis or the field work and the analysis and how they can be used for other things. And, and the project I'm going to describe um, has two kinds of connections in terms of the theme here tonight. One connection is connecting ancient cities and settlements to contemporary cities. And the other kind of connection is connecting archaeology to other disciplines. And I don't, I don't just mean a thing that archaeologists often say, oh, archaeology is part of anthropology. No, 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 this is nothing with anthropology. I'm collaborating with economists and physicists. So I'm really going beyond anthropology and archaeology. And it's, it's where archaeology is making contribution to an issue, to some findings that I find really sort of exciting and fundamental. And so when people move into cities, when cities form, something happens in the interactions within cities that has outputs. And those interactions have, have regularities across the ages and ac around the world, quantitative regularities that you could predict certain things. I mean, on, on the thing here, I have a quote from Jeffrey West. Tell me how fast people walk down the street, and I'll tell you the size of their city. I mean, that's, that's, he's talking about modern cities. That's pretty outrageous. But there's, there's some truth to that. So what I'm going to do is sort of tell you my understanding of how this line of analysis got started, how I got involved in it, and then sort of what I've been doing in the last uh, few years with a, a group of scholars from various disciplines. So. Um, if we begin in, uh, in the field of biology, it's been known for about a century. If you take all the mammals, and all the species of mammals, and you range them in size from the smallest, from like mice to elephants or mice to whales, um, and you compare the mass of the element the, the, of the species, how large is the animal compared to its metabolism? If an animal is larger, it has to have more metabolism to keep itself going, right? And what biologists figured out a long time ago is that it's not a linear relationship. Okay, in other words, if say a dogs are twice as big as cats on average, it's probably more than that, but just, just say that. Okay, well the metabolism of dogs is not twice the metabolism of cats. It's less than that. 
Okay, it's called sublinear scaling. The metabolism of mammals increases with the size of the species, but slower than the species than the size increases. Okay, so bigger bigger mammals, of course, have bigger metabolisms, but at a lower rate. Okay, it's less, if you're three times as big, your metabolism is not three times as much. It's a very regular relationship, quantitatively, biologists have known it for, for a century, but they haven't figured it out. They hadn't figured out, well, why does this work? How does this work? We don't have a model, we don't have an explanation. And um, in walks a physicist, Jeffrey West, a physicist from Los Alamos, and, and he was hanging out at the Santa Fe Institute. And the Santa Fe Institute is like a think tank for the science of complexity for complex systems. And they have everything from physicists to biologists to anthropologists and economists. And they look at complex systems across lots of different, different scales and, and different domains. And Jeffrey West is associated with the Santa Fe Institute. And he got together with a couple of quantitative biologists. And they came up with a quantitative explanation for this metabolism relationship in mammals. And it's called uh, metabolic scaling theory. And I can't tell you what it is, so I don't understand it. <laughs> but it's a mathematical model that predicts exactly how metabolism relates to body size. And this was, this was seen as a great breakthrough, and they published in the journal Science, and everybody thought this was wonderful, and we now understand this thing that we've known for a century in biology. Well, what does that have to do with archaeology? Well, physicists like to go out and sort of colonize other disciplines and go in and tell people in other fields how to do their business. And so most of us resent it when physicists do this. Well, OK, so Jeffrey West says, all right, let's go to the human sciences. What can we do in the social sciences that's sort of like metabolic scaling? And I said, cities. Cities are sort of like organisms. They have inputs. They have outputs. They have to have resources. They exist in an environment. Can we find any regularities in the size of cities? Will the size of cities predict anything about those cities? Well, it turns out that urban scholars had known for some time that there are some regularities in the size of cities. If you take, say, all the cities in the US, the biggest one, New York, has a population. I don't know what it is. But the next biggest one, LA, has half that. And the third biggest one has one third of that. And the fourth biggest one has one fourth of that. And we still understand why this is. But there are regularities in cities. So Jeffrey West um, got together with another physicist, um, um, Luis Betancourt, and Jose Lobo, who's an economist at ASU and also the, the Santa Fe Institute, and, and a few others. And they started looking at the size of cities in relation to other characteristics. And what they found was the size of the city predicts certain things about what goes on in that city. And not just on a general level, but on a precise quantitative level. So one of the things is the density of cities. As the populate, take all the cities in the US, okay? Arrange them from the smallest to the largest in the population. Look at how their area compares to population. Area has sublinear scaling. In other words, if a city is twice as big as another city, it doesn't have twice the area. It has less than twice the area. OK? The area increases at a slower rate than the population does. So if your population, if your area increases at a slower rate than population, what does that say about density? Big cities are denser than small cities, right? The population density of large, of, of large cities, population-wise, large cities are denser. They not only have bigger area, they have to because they're bigger, more people, they're more compact. And the amazing thing is, it's a very regular relationship. It's very precise. If you look at US cities, it works. If you look at European cities, it works. If you look at cities any place you can measure them, it works. What's going on here? I don't know. Um, they found other characteristics of cities, which are even more surprising, that have what's called superlinear scaling. That's when cities get bigger, things increase even more than the size. Uh, for example, the income of cities. Personal and how much people make, average income per person in larger cities. A city that's twice as big, the incomes aren't twice as, it's more than twice as much. OK, uh, if you take innovations, the number of patents that are, that, are, that are registered in cities of different sizes. Large cities have more patents, but they have more than their share than smaller cities. Okay, super linear scaling. The number of patents is increasing faster than the population of cities. Uh, if you look at negative things, crime, poverty rates, 
uh, Jose Lobo looked at rock bands. <laughs> the number of rock bands, a big city has more rock bands than a small city. Okay, yeah, you'd expect that. But it has more than their share of rock bands. If, if a city is twice as big as another city, it doesn't have twice as many rock bands, it has more than twice as many rock bands. Something is going on in cities. The way people live in cities and work and interact in cities that generates an increase in social and economic phenomena. Um, this has been called the social reactor model of cities. Cities are social reactors. Things happen in cities that have a bigger impact. And these things happen whatever you look, where you look at US cities, or you look at cities in Latin America and Europe, wherever you look, it's the same. And that's the street, you know, they found people walk down the street faster in big cities. That's this quote that, from Jeffrey West. Tell me how fast people walk down the street and I'll tell you the size of the city. Now that's a little bit of a boast. It's not a precise relationship. We're talking about averages and statistical patterns, but they're very strong statistical patterns. They're very regular. If you don't need statistics, the R squared, the, the, the power of the statistical relationship is very high. Um, so, so according to the physicists, they have a law of cities now. Now, so, the social scientist here is we have a law of human behavior. You're going, no, no, no. We don't have laws of human behavior. Humans don't, you know, we're humans. We have, we have choice. We can do whatever we want. Um, but it's sure a, a big regularity. So um, these folks at the, now meanwhile, at the Santa Fe Institute, they had a uh, postdoc. They have a program of postdoctoral scholars there where they get these really smart people who go up there and do incredible things, whatever they want, for a couple of years. And they had an archaeologist. And some of you probably know him, Scott Ortman. Uh, and he's actually given the Archaeology Cafe in Phoenix in, uh, in November. And uh, Scott was a postdoctoral scholar at uh, Santa Fe Institute. He has a PhD at ASU, and now he teaches at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And Scott started working on settlement patterns in central Mexico to try to figure out whether it's these patterns of cities would actually work in an ancient society. And he found that they did. It's like, whoa. Now, and so at this point, um, these guys invited me up to Santa Fe because I, I, I I'm an expert in ancient cities, and they wanted to know is this is this logical that that ancient cities are gonna are gonna this is gonna work for ancient cities as well as modern cities. Um, and so I well I, I don't know what do I know about this stuff? I know nothing about this stuff. So I started reading. I started reading in economic geography and urban economics, and quickly got above my level of comprehension. <laughs> Uh, but I read what I, and, and what it seemed to me reading the literature was that um, the standard, the way, the way this was being explained in economics and geography and other fields, these kinds of scaling relationships, these regularities, they were being explained based on factors like wage labor and how workers commute to firms and how firms interact with one another. And in other words, the modern capitalist economy. Well, guess what? Ancient economies weren't like that. They didn't have wage labor. They didn't have firms. Some of them didn't even have money. Uh, so the, the economies of ancient societies are radically different than the economies of today. And so it seemed to me, reading the literature, that the way people thought that these regularities developed in modern cities was based on the modern economy. So my reaction was, this, is, this isn't going to work for ancient societies. It's just not. So they invited me up to the Santa Fe Institute for a week. And I was going to give a public lecture on Tuesday. And I was going to be there all week and hang out with these guys and talk to them and all. And so I got up there on Monday. And they quickly convinced me that these scaling relationships, these patterns identified in modern cities, are not based on the modern economy. It's not because you have wage labor and capitalist firms and commuting and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's based on more fundamental aspects of human behavior. And Luis Betancourt had developed a quantitative model that basically predicts and explains these quantitative relationships about how population predicts density, how population predicts social outcomes, and, and so on. And that model is based on individuals traveling, how fast can they travel, how many other individuals do they interact with, is their movement constrained by the built environment or not, and when they interact with other individuals, what happens from that interaction? 
In other words, it's a very basic model. But when you apply the model and quantify it and work it through, it predicts very precisely these relationships in modern cities. Um, and if that, if that model is right, which I think it is, then it implies that, well, these scaling relationships, it's not a feature just of modern capitalist economies. Okay, this should be a feature of all human settlements. Um, and so the, the question is, can we find data about this? Now, they convinced me this of Monday, and I was set to give a talk on Tuesday saying this is all bogus, it's not going to work. <laughs> so I was quickly changing my slides around, and, and I you know, made enough adjustments. And, um, and basically, I became a convert. The idea of this kind of this kind of approach should work for ancient cities, but um, but it's an empirical question. It's not whether I think it's going to work or not. We need data. We need to test this. We need to measure ancient cities. We need to measure these things and see if it works. And it's it's hard to find this data archaeologically. Um, now, the model, Luis says it's simple. He says, "Oh, the math is easy. I'll step you through it." Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, even though I was a math major for one semester in college. Uh, <laughs> when he's up there at the blackboard drawing stuff, I could sort of follow along. But the one I'm reading, I go, um, OK, <laughs> if, you say, if you say so. Um, so we decided, well, let's try to find archaeological data. Let's try to find archaeological cases and historical cases and see whether these same quantitative relationships existed in the past. Because if they did, this implies that there's something really fundamental about how people interact within settlements, that the process of people coming together in cities and other settlements generates changes in a way that, that really transcends the differences between ancient and modern societies. So um, we started working on this. Uh, we, got, we had a, 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 a RA, a research assistant, up at ASU, and we thought, what about medieval towns? There's a lot of data on medieval towns. There's a census data. We know their sizes. A lot of them, have the people have reconstructed maps of these medieval cities. And so for the period early 14th century, right before the plague, we found data on almost 200 towns and cities throughout Europe. We had Britain, France, Italy, uh, Low Countries, Germany. We had throughout Europe, and we had the population sizes from censuses that were taken. We had this area of the city, which we could measure from maps. And it's exactly the same relationship as the modern cities. It's sublinear scaling. Area scales with population in less than proportionally. It's exactly the same relationship. Larger medieval cities are denser than smaller medieval cities with a very sort of precise and strong quantitative relationship. Um, so uh, meanwhile, um, Scott had a grant to work on this at the University of Colorado. So we thought, well, What's, a, what's the best ancient society that's going to have information? I work on the Aztecs. I've done stuff on cities and the size of cities, and there just aren't enough settlements. You need a whole, you need a series of settlements, say 30 settlements, where you can measure the population and measure something else. And we just don't have that. Um, and so we thought, what about Roman Empire? The Roman Empire. There's lots of cities. There's been lots of research. So we have a postdoc at Colorado who's an expert in Roman Hermitism. And it turns out that Roman cities follow this same relationship as the modern cities and the medieval cities. The larger cities are denser than the smaller cities at the same precise relationship. I mean, I find this astounding. What, what's going on here? How does this happen? I don't know how this happens. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the relationship between population and area. Um, now, what about superlinear scaling? Are there economic factors in ancient cities that will increase with population in a superlinear fashion? Well, that's even harder to measure. It's harder to come up with data um, than, than for the area. Uh, so what do we have for that? We had um, Scott found, we found some data in the Andes of Peru for the Inca Empire, and where we can measure the the size of sites, we have the population, and we have a measure of wealth. Now, how do you measure wealth with archaeological data? One of the ways we do it is with the size of houses. Generally, other things being equal, wealthier people have larger houses than smaller people. This works today, right? And this worked in the ancient world. 
And so we had in, the, in these Inca and pre-Inca settlements, uh, the houses were visible. We could measure the houses. So you could plot the population against the sort of total wealth in these communities. And guess what? It's super linear scaling. It's the same rate that modern cities scale if you're looking at GDP or income or patents or any of these things. It's the same quantitative relationship. Um, and I actually did find some cities in Mexico where, for Aztec period cities, where we could measure the size of the site and the size of their plazas, figuring how do plazas scale with population. So we got some results, and they don't match anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a regular relationship. It's bizarre. It's a, it's a regular relationship. It just doesn't match the pattern for social economic outputs, for density, for infrastructure, for anything else. So I don't know what we're doing with that. Um, Scott looked at some settlement patterns from that weren't urban, from non-urban societies. So he had data from the Mesa Verde region. Okay, that's where he does his, he's done field work up there. He looked at sites there, the, the size of this population size, the housing to, as a measure of wealth, and guess what? It's super linear scaling. He had an example from Mandan settlements in the upper Missouri area. Same thing, we had a bunch of sites, and, and we knew the houses, they had different sizes, larger and smaller sites, larger and smaller houses within these sites. You measure them all, and you get super linear scaling. What's going on here? Uh, Roman cities, I don't know where the super linear scaling is at. This is in process right now. But for the medieval cities, um, we found economic historians use tax data to say something about past patterns of wealth. And so we have taxation data from basically Henry VIII's time. And that scales with population in a super linear fashion. And did you know that in Henry VIII's time, they had a tax on beards? <laughs> it's called the beard tax. I'll shave mine off. I don't know. Uh, um, so we're getting all these results that for the ancient cities, and ancient, not even cities, even sort of village settlement patterns match the modern ones. Um, what's going on? This, I find this amazing that there are these patterns. I mean, as an anthropologist, anthropology used to like to look at uh, comparisons among different cultures to find similarities. And then that went out of fashion, and, and for the last couple of decades, anthropologists have sort of looked at the unique features of individual cultures. And so in my training as an anthropologist, there's nothing that would explain why all these different urban systems have the same quantitative patterns. There's nothing that would really explain that. Um, and there is this Luis Betancourt's quantitative model, which predicts these things. But does that sort of explain them? Um, so I have a few things on this handout. Um, our project is called the Social Reactors Project on the, on the top of the handout. A tiny bit of math, and just if you're interested, these are power laws. They're exponential relationships. And you make a logarithmic transformation, then you have a linear relationship. And you can do regression analysis, and it's very easy to analyze quantitatively. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> well, what it means is, I'm not, we're not doing some fancy analysis that no one understands. We're doing linear regression, which is one of the most basic statistical analyses. Um, and uh, the log transform allows us to do linear regression on these data. And so um, anyone looking at these data can see. So we have on the sublinear scaling for the medieval cities, the regression line is below the line of, um, of, of the linear slope. In other words, a sublinear. For the superlinear scaling, here's, a, here's some modern data on the left and the, and the data from the Andes houses on the right, and they are above the linear line. The regression line for the settlements is above, so it's super linear. Um, so I put at the bottom here sort of one view of how this might work. Um, it has to do with people moving into a settlement. Settlements grow, and, and that increases the amount of social interaction. And it's increased social interactions. And, and a term from an architectural historian, Spiro Kostov, 
he used the term energized crowding. That large cities with large people have processes of energized crowding. You, people run into more people, they meet more people. Um, those interactions have some kind of influence, have some kind of outcome. Maybe they're just social interactions, maybe they're economic interactions, but the sum total of all these in a city produce some kind of outcome. Uh, one of the things they produce is what's called scalar stress. There's like too many people. How do you deal with too many people? Well, maybe you stay in your neighborhood, or you try to make the scale of life a little bit s smaller, or you do something because there's too many people. But another kind of outcome is economic, uh, economic patterns, economic processes that grow out of this interaction. And these account for greater production of wealth, greater production of various social and economic quantities from the population. In other words, these interactions are having an effect that go beyond the number of people. Now, does that sound vague? Well, yeah, that's pretty vague. I, I still I can't provide sort of a simple, clear explanation. But I find the regularities, I find these amazing. Just, I mean, I, I was amazed when I first read this stuff about modern cities. Wow, that's really interesting. Oh, this will never work for the past. But it works for historical data on medieval cities, for Roman cities, for cities in South America, for in cities in the Southwest. Settlements, I wouldn't call them cities. Village settlements. It works every place we've managed to test it. Although my plaza data are a little bit weird, but apart from that. Um, so what? I can't explain why there are these things, except there's something about the way people interact within cities that goes beyond an individual system. It goes beyond, an individ it goes beyond what happens to people as individuals. They create something socially and economically by interacting within settlements that is sort of larger than what's going on with the individual people. Now, so how is this a connection? How is this archaeology? Well, wh what archaeology is doing is we're providing evidence. We're providing data that can be evaluate these models that actually they come out of studies of modern cities. Um, and for me, as an archaeologist, I'm, I'm really pleased that people in the disciplines want to see our data. Archaeology is part of anthropology departments in US universities. And what happens in an anthropology department? Do cultural anthropologists ever come up to archaeologists and go, let me see your data? No. Do cultural anthropologists give a hoot about what archaeologists are doing. No. <laughs> but what I found in my own career is that as I started to get into comparative urbanism and studying ancient cities and comparing them around the world and trying to compare them to modern cities, is that I encountered scholars in other disciplines, urban planners, want to know about ancient cities. How are they planned? How are they laid out? Sociologists want to know, wow, did those ancient cities have neighborhoods? Because we studied neighborhoods in modern cities. Ancient cities had neighborhoods too. I think that's one of the few universals of, of, of cities around the world is neighborhoods. They're all organized into neighborhoods. Um, political scientists want to know about how cities were governed in the past. And economists want to know how city economics worked. So it's, it's a case of archaeological data are of interest in a wider range of scholarship. But you wouldn't know this just looking at anthropology. Now, how can archaeological data be used this way? Well, it only happens if people do good analysis, do good field work, do good analysis, and publish their results. If, the day, if things are worked up and published to the point where they can be used, we can go to a survey report from the Andes that none of us have worked on, none of us know diddly about the Andes. We can take that settlement pattern report, and we can get the data out of there and do something useful with it. So that shows that that field work was done well, the analysis was done well, and the stuff was published well. And so if archaeological data, it doesn't just tell us about, you know, what the Holocom were doing in the Gila River Valley. It tells us that, but that information can be used in broader domains if it's, well, if it's, if it's properly analyzed and properly published. So it's a case of archaeological data can really inform larger issues. And how this whole scaling thing is going to come out, I don't know. I find it really exciting. We're trying to find more examples. We're trying to figure out patterns. We're trying to figure out you know, how do tropical low-density cities, they seem to work a little differently. How do they work? I don't know how this is all going to come out. But the, these regular patterns are, are quite amazing. But the only way that we can actually 
talk about these or see these patterns is because the data have been gathered well, analyzed well, and published well. So I'll stop there. So if you have a question, would you raise your hand and, and Mike, yeah. Michael will call on you and, and then maybe he'll repeat the question so that we can catch it? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Um, one of them, the first one is, what, do you, what parameters do you use for the samples that you're analyzing? Is it time? It's not cultures, or is it cultures? What, we, what we're doing is we're analyzing a batch of settlements from a certain time in a certain period. Mm -hmm. And since we have an economist who's a real stickler on methods, we've got to have a sample of 30. Okay, now my second question is, yeah. there's lots of Maya settlement data and Maya cities, and you could also pull in Teotihuacan. Well, have you done that? Or have you Te Teotihuacan is separate from the Maya. We'd want to, I, well, I am true. itching to analyze Maya cities. I'm tempted to say I'd give my right arm to analyze Maya cities, but I won't quite say that. Uh, <laughs> the trouble with Maya settlements is there aren't enough of them that have enough data where we can get a population for the settlement and then something else to compare to the population. Um, and I, you know, I've asked the Mayanists I know, I have graduate students of Mayanists, we're like, there just aren't enough, there's not enough data because it would be really interesting because the Maya are low density cities. It's a very different pattern from most parts of the world. And so does it work the same way? Does it not work at all? I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to do that. And, and they did interact by trade uh, or something with Teotihuacan. Right, the Maya interact with Teotihuacan and, I, and Teotihuacan, yeah, we have a lot of information about it, but we don't have 30 sites of the classic period in central Mexico, no. which we would want to have. Yeah. Societies. Does that extend to the coefficient itself, meaning the values yes. are similar, if not the same? Yes. Do we get the same same values? These are um, these are the exponents of of the of the power law, and they are surprisingly the same. They are, and the the theory predicts that you'll have exponents like two thirds or five sixths or one and a third. And we, we get those results, yeah. I mean, it's too small to see on the handout, but the exponents are, it's like 1.13 in, in both cases. It's very similar. It's eerily similar. Uh, this is one of the things that freaks me out. What's going on here? Yes. Can the model account for migrations coming in and out? Well, um, no. <laughs> Basically, what we're doing, like I said, we're taking a batch of cities from an area uh, from a given time period. And, and ideally, that time period is short as possible. But archaeologically, you know, it may be a single period of, of several centuries. I would think if you had a case where there's sort of a lot of migration coming in and a lot of change during a period, I mean, maybe that would foul up the results. I don't know. I mean, we're, we're dealing with the, archae the, the archaeological cases that we have and however the chronology and settlements are, are analyzed in those cases. So, yeah, that could really foul things up, I think. Yeah. In terms of, well, uh, Luis Bencorn is an interesting guy. He's a physicist. He's, he's trained as a physicist. He's done physics. He's gotten into this analysis of cities. And one of the reasons that social scientists really resent it when physicists come into our fields is they don't pay any attention to the knowledge. They just sort of do some equation and say, it's, yeah, explain it. <laughs> and usually they have it and they've screwed it up. Well, Luis really does his homework. And he has read a lot in urban... When I met him for the first time, it was a conference at, uh, at ASU before I went up to Santa Fe Institute. And he said, oh, I wish you... He started talking to me about my, my book on Aztec cities that he had read. Most of my colleagues haven't read my book, <laughs> and he's read it. He, ha he has a grant from the uh, Gates Foundation to study the, the form and dynamics of informal settlements, shanty towns in the developing world. 
uh, applying, you know, looking at aerial photography and, and Google Earth and then applying quantitative methods. And so he has really um, applied his skills as a physicist to the area of urban studies and not just superficially by throwing in a formula or two, but really getting into the literature and, and that. The relationship between archaeology and, and urban planning. Well, in this particular kind of thing that, that we're, we're studying here, urban planners um, really don't, aren't really involved too much. I think they're focused on individual cities, how they're planned and laid out, and, and we're looking at sort of quantitative patterns in, in a big batch of cities. So urban planning is a, is a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, in other work that I do, I've been more closely involved with urban planners and looking at ancient neighborhoods and ancient urban planning and, and things like that. But in this particular study, urban planning is really a little bit more distantly connected. And plot that against the other factors that you've been speaking of. So how we study um, population of medieval cities related and the balance between immigration and the death rate. And, um, you know, there's been a whole lot of research on the demography of medieval society and medieval cities. And I'm not an expert, so I'm going to cop out here. And, <laughs> um, I, and I know that, yeah, there, there is a lot of research on that. And, and there's been a lot of clever work using things like um, death rate, as well as using things like cemeteries and, and various kinds of data to try to understand the medieval society. When I look at scholarship on, on medieval society, as an archaeologist specializing in Mesoamerica, I just get disgusted with how much information they have. You know, it's like cheating. You know, they have so much data, so much written data, plus they have better archaeological data than we have, and it's, anyway, <laughs> yeah. This might be a stretch, but is there anybody look at the correlation between non-human species, population density, vis-a-vis -vis curve size, yeah. Yeah. Specific area. Could this be a mammalian thing or an evolutionary thing? I mean, you're looking for a... Ex excellent, qu excellent question. Has, has this, been, this kind of relationship been looked at for non-human species? And uh, we've actually talked about that a little bit um, in our group. We were trying to figure out what is the limits of this, this model? What would be the limits, you know, how, if we push this as far as it will go? And, and so we've been looking at the hunter and gatherer campsites. And they show, very, they show different relationships. Hunter-gatherer campsites, larger camps are less dense than smaller camps, which is the opposite of all these urban systems and, and, and agricultural societies. And so we're trying to understand that right now. So well, what about primates? What about chimps? And we haven't really, I mean, they, they don't have settlements, right? They, they, they sleep various places and they move around, but they don't seem to have settlements and what we're talking about is interactions within a settlement where people come either stay there or they come back to there but um let's talk about herd size let's say a, a herd of bison do they a massive or wildebeest do they act differently in large groups than they yeah. in small groups is their foraging size different i mean well correlative yeah no that's a very good question and um i know that um the field of quantitative ecology is quite active, and people have probably looked at that, and, um, but I haven't. But that's a very good question, and that's something we've talked about. Should we look at other species? How, does it, how, how do things work? So, but I can't tell you yet. <laughs> yeah? You may have already mentioned this, but does your model show any connection between resources and the different populations? Not intangible, intangible. Not just money. Yeah, resource. So, how does a model account for uh, differences in resources? Well, the scaling model is really looking at a small number of factors in a system. We're not explaining the whole system. We're not taking everything into account. We're just taking. We're trying to get you know a group of cities at a given in a given region at a given time and looking at very specific measures. And um, 
But resources play into it in terms of wealth. And that's, you know, since archaeologically, how are we going to measure some of these social economic outputs? If we can measure wealth, and resources are part of wealth. So in that sense, now we, haven't, we don't have a specific model now that relates resources to any of these scaling properties, but that's, I think, where it might tie in, is, is you know, if some households have access to more resources that, than their greater wealth, and you could have more of those households in larger settlements than small. I mean, that's the kind of place where it might play into it. Emily. Well, well, we have, um, well, Scott said the Valley of Mexico settlement patterns, the Valley of Mexico settlement pattern data and they fit the patterns. I have Mesoamerican plaza size, which is a little bit bizarre. And then there's the Southwest and, and, and Upper Missouri cases. So, is it, so we have a number of cases from the New World. How you get population. How you get popu... Well, I mean, that's the thing, you know, because the, the standard way that we figure out populations, okay, uh, when you do a survey and you find, say, all the sites in a region, is you take the area of the sites, and you multiply them by, okay, it was, we're going to say, you know, 40 people per hectare. Well, then you can't compare your population with your area because you've used the area to measure your population. So that rules out, you know, a lot of archaeological data. So we have to find cases where people have counted the population not based on the area. So this is the Montaro area in the Andes where this, the houses are still preserved. So you can count the houses, you can measure the population by counting houses, and then you can use the size of the house as a measure of wealth. Um, so the first two sites I excavated after my PhD uh, with my wife Cindy, who's an archaeologist, and um, in Mexico, these houses, these sites had the houses visible on the surface. And we could map the whole sites without excavating, and then we had to excavate a sample of them. And I didn't realize how, how unique that was, because most archaeological sites, any other Aztec site I've seen, the houses are buried. You don't know where the heck they are. So we estimate populations by measuring the area and then applying a constant. So we can't do this kind of thing. So, but there are, we're, we're, we're looking around. So if anybody knows any cases, so we'll pay it off. let me know. We're looking for more possible cases. We're trying to make the, we're pushing this model. One of the things we're doing is pushing this model to see if it breaks. Where is it going to break? I mean, it doesn't seem to work for hunters and gatherers, but we're still sort of, we still haven't done a full analysis there. Um, and so we're sort of trying to find examples to see how, how, how widespread is this phenomenon. Yeah? So what's your difference between a city and a village? And did you study large villages versus small villages? Um, similar? Or villages egalitarian? Well, that's a big question. Um, within a given system, OK? say, Aztec settlements, where you have cities and villages. The cities are where civic institutions are. That's where the temples are. That's where the palace is. That's where the ball court is. Villages don't have these things. People live in cities, people in villages, but the cities also, the king is living in the city. The marketplace is in the city. So they have these, these institutions that don't exist in a village. Um, but if these scaling patterns are working when we measure, whether we're measuring cities, towns, and villages, if they work in like Southwest systems where you don't have any cities, it suggests it's, it's, it's what the relevant thing is the human settlement and how big it is. And one of the implications of all this is that the size of settlements, the numbers of people in a settlement, whether a village, a town, or a city, has an effect on what's going on. And that's irrespective of whether there's pyramids there or markets or anything else. That the, the sort of relevant factor in, in this kind of study is the number of people and, and within a settlement and what happens among those people. And if that's the case, well, what difference does it make whether it's a city or a village? You want to know how many people are they and how are they interacting? So in that sense, it really gets us beyond worrying too much about is this a city or not a city? I don't know if that... Makes sense. Are you saying that, that the relationship between things like density, number of people, area of town, 
is independent of the century that you looked at the data for? Yeah, are these relationships of population density independent of the time period with it that, that we're dealing with? Um, yeah. And then the, how can you explain or write off things like modern building techniques which allow much higher density because you can put yeah. up elevators and yeah. have 30 yeah. story apartment houses, couldn't have them in ancient times. Yeah. Or the fact that transportation allows cities today to be net importers or exporters yeah. and they can buy their, their, their necessities of life because yeah. they're made a thousand miles away. They couldn't do that a thousand years ago. Yeah. Uh, how can you rationalize how those differences between modern and ancient times don't matter? The, so the main differences you mentioned were things like transportation systems. You can bring food into cities. You can move stuff around. And apart, you can have you know hundred-story buildings. You can have Trump towers. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> hey, it's the vice. The vice. I want to thank you all for coming when it, tonight's the vice presidential debate. I know how much you all wanted to see the vice presidential debate, and I've done my best. Anyway, let's leave politics out of this. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons that I find this so puzzling is these obvious differences between contemporary cities and ancient cities. There's no doubt that many of the dynamics of modern cities and ancient cities are very different. I'm not saying modern cities and ancient cities are the same. They're not, they're extremely different. But on a certain level, fundamental level of dealing with people and density and interactions, there are similarities. And, and, and the thing is, this, it's not just me making this claim. This is, this is empirical data that we're measuring. You look skeptical. I am. <laughs> I'm skeptical. You have, you have to have a, a great faith in your data. Yes. And the, the factors I mentioned, and probably many others I could think of, given enough time, would cause me to re-question the validity of the data, much of which from ancient times is at best a good guess. Yeah, well, but the point is that's why we're, we're trying to get cases where we have enough, we have situations with enough cases that we can do statistical analysis and calculate confidence intervals. Um, we're trying to find cases that have been well analyzed archeologically. And we're, we have you know, high quality archeological data. And there's all, all kinds of problems with archaeological data. I'm the first to tell you that. I can list 100 problems with archaeological data for doing social analysis in the past. But we still, we're getting these patterns. These patterns are strong enough that they're coming through the vagaries of archaeological preservation and, and all. And um, you know, on, on one level, I'm as skeptical as you. How, how does this happen? Yes? Yeah. But the number of people in an area, in effect, account for the combinations and permutations of differences in that population, which would not occur in a homogeneous, in a more homogeneous um, village or small area. So it, it sounds as though your direct connect is between the permutations and differences in the people that come together in a close proximity So you, well, you're so that you have you have people of different types, different categories, different specialties, different knowledge, right. and and in a larger settlement, you have a greater diversity right. of people, that's and that's probably one of the factors that's that's generating these things. In a larger settlement, you'll just by chance, by nature, right. have more of this variation than you will in a smaller settlement, and that is probably part of what's generating these outcomes. Yeah, so that that's a good observation. Questions from the wife are always dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you keep mentioning ancient, but what you've really said so far is Rome. Have you looked into Greece or Egypt and Persia? Even ancient China has really good archaeological data. We have not found um, cases. We have not found situations with, with enough data where you have enough settlements of one time period in one region. We've looked in Greece. We've looked in Mesopotamia. 
I, I mean, I must be, every year or two, I pester Jason Orr. He's a, a Mesopotamian specialist at Harvard, and he's interested in early cities, and, and I'm always bugging him. You know, come on, Mesopotamia. They've done a lot of research on it. It's got to be enough, and there's just, you know, what, and, and China, we have not found cases where, again, where there's enough cities with enough, where we can estimate the population independent of the area and then compare it to some other variable. It's the, the, the data requirements for this kind of study, archaeologically, are pretty high. You know, we, we need, really need pretty good archaeological data, and we just have, yeah. Um, the, I haven't looked into that specifically. Um, if you think there's enough settlement, I, I've pestered people working all over the world, sending them emails and stuff, and they probably think I'm crazy, you know, and looking for cases. Do you have some situations where you have, you know, 30 cities and blah, 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 and they either don't answer me or they say, no, we don't have that. Of course not. What is archaeology? What do you want? Um, you know, I, I really, yeah, post-Roman Egypt, there's fantastic written data, and a lot of those settlements have been identified and mapped, and um, I guess that's a possibility. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're still looking for cases that we can get some analysis on. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So this is a broad generalization that you, it should work in your Aztec area of primary research. If you were given a large grant from the National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. how would this information structure you going out to do a, a new set of field projects, say choosing a large, medium, and small um, set of sites along a continuum, or maybe three large cities, or how, how would this information structure your approach to the archaeological record? How, how would it structure next, field work? Yeah, next year. So, Archaeology Southwest is going to give me a million dollars? Is that what you're... The National Science Foundation is going to have a special oh, oh. program for this. That's what you're interested You know, someone's, there's got to be one hard question in every, you know. <laughs> um, I'm just, I don't, I'm not trying to... Yeah, no, that, that's a very good curious. question. Um, uh, thinking in terms of what I know about the archaeological record in central Mexico, I just... Okay, okay, I can see how we might do it. And um, which is, we can't count houses, we can't get the independent population estimates. We could estimate population by area. So if we did a survey and we measured the areas of sites, which is a standard thing you do on a survey, but then what would you do to compare to that area? You would need good sort of economic or social data. So you would need to have surface collections that are quite large that give you enough artifacts that you could look at, say, measures of wealth, such as how many imports? What's the rate, what's the number of, what's the wealth as related to the number of imports compared to the population? Or the level of craft production? Um, now, in most surveys, you can't, these ones I know in Mesoamerica, you can't do that systematically because they don't do big enough collections at a large enough number of sites. So you'd have to have a good chronology an area where you could get the sites well, and then you can, you can do these do surface collections, sort of intensive, I don't know, maybe in central Mexico, maybe even seven or nine meters squared. I mean, I, and I did a survey which we did five meter by five meter collections in plowed fields, and they get a lot of artifacts. And, and I actually, I want to try that out on this, but actually my graduate students have the data, and it's, I'm trying to, I haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, so I guess that would be one way to do it. it would be a high quality survey where you especially want to get good samples of economic data such as imports, craft production, and, and so on. So. Yeah. How do you count for high so rise? When you're, putting, when you're putting people in tall buildings, you're effectively increasing the surface area of your cells. How do you account for that? Tall, tall buildings, in a sense, increase 
you know, your wife isn't supposed to ask these hard questions, you know. <laughs> we got to drive home, lady. You can ask me. <laughs> well, okay, the, what, the way, okay, the, the, the apartment, tall apartment buildings give you much denser settlement, of course. Okay, so that, that affects the number of people in your, in your population count, and you still have the area that you're measuring. And that just, that, that just goes into the calculation. What they use for contemporary cities, they don't use city per se, they use a, a statistical metropolitan area, um, SMA, which is basically an area uh, where the labor flows come from. So if, say for New York City, it's not the, you know, the five boroughs of New York, it's the five boroughs of New York plus the area where people are commuting into the city. And so they're measuring something that's bigger than a quote city and within that whole area they're taking the people that live there and the density and so you're not really doing anything different that you have these tall buildings um, the fact that you get very high densities in you know New York City or Hong Kong or other cities all over the world it, it's just I don't know it's, it's part of the picture um, I mean see that's one th that's one reason that this is all this is so surprising to me all these things that you might think would foul up a relationship like this mm -hmm. And yet the relationships come through. The relationships are still there. You know, we can come up with 50 reasons why, what, why, this, why this shouldn't work or why things are going to foul up the relationships and it's just not going to work. But it still works. There's something fundamental about people interacting in cities which transcends all this other stuff or is stronger than all of these other factors which can be fouling things up. And um, I, I just find that really fascinating and, and really exciting.